Hey guys, welcome back to an episode of UAP Studies Podcast. We're we're back in full swing, Michael. Uh, we're coming out with episodes every Sunday. Sometimes, Indeed. Yeah, and then sometimes we record two episodes. I think we got us booked for several recordings per day. But today we only have one, which is awesome, uh, because it's going to be an in-depth look um, into more of the history of UAPs, UFO, Foo Fighters. Yeah, Foo um, Fighters. Yeah. I'm and excited it's not, about that. It's not an area of of uh, expertise on my part, and I, I mentioned that to Graham that it's uh, it's it's something I need to be educated on a little bit because I don't know my history as much as I should like to know, and uh, I think it's it's good to have an expert like him that that wrote I think like four or five books on the subject. He's doing it for every two years, like you know, starting from the forties to all the way to the fifties. Now I think he's doing, uh, and it's crazy because the amount of activity and what's recorded, the data that's out there, the research that people like grandma's done over the years is overwhelming. Um, yeah. You could get a lot of data pour over a lot of documents and yeah, uh, you could convict a man. Yeah. You could convict a man to death with the evidence that <laughs> we have so far. You know what I mean? Like if you look at it that way, um, that's why denial and omissions from the gatekeepers is so insulting. It's like, I know everybody could see the elephant in a room, but it's like, you guys are crazy. There's no elephant. Like it's There's never an elephant. Yeah. Um, so w without further ado, Graham, welcome to the uh, podcast. It's an honor to have you here. I got my cup of coffee uh, ready because my voice is still a little bit. Uh, I started smoking again. I apologize. Um, it does this to my voice. <laughs> So I realize it's uh, their life choices. Well, made, it's so. just guys. I told you not to emulate me. I'm no pleasure to emulate uh, sure. horrible, horrible habits, coffee and smoking. I got a short lifespan. I swear to God. Um, but while I'm here, this is what we do the podcast. And it's to learn from people like Graham about um, the, the history of, of UFO. So Graham, uh, you've been everywhere, coast to coast, podcasts, TV shows, you've written books, you've been at seminars, you've been educating the public on this research and very important um, piece of historical information that seems to be trying to be uh, just quieted. It's trying to be hushed down, like, no, no, don't pay attention to this. This is not, you know, they're not real, they're not here, but you got, you know, so many years, decades of research proving otherwise that ever since we started dropping bombs from planes, they've been like, what are you guys up to? And um, it's very concerning because they're, the national security or the global security um, is such that, you know, something like that is is a threat to us. Um, it might not be intentional, but to us seems like a threat. So maybe explain how you got involved in looking into the history of this and your passion in it because you wrote four or five books on it. So obviously you're passionate about it. So uh, yeah, let's delve into your career here yeah. and, and see what, uh, what you came up with. Okay, Jason. Um, I mean, I've been interested in UFOs pro probably 45 years now. So go back to maybe even a bit longer, maybe get on for 50 years. So I think I was about eight or nine years old. Um, my mother bought me a book, which she thought was another of these science fiction novels. I was, I was reading back then Isaac Asimov titles, that nice spaceships on the front. And she bought me a book, similar thing, except it wasn't. It was a book on UFOs, had a picture of flying saucer on the front. And being a sponge back then, you know, that, anything that took my fancy, anything that really caught my interest, I would read it. I'd read it to death, cover to cover. I would, um, you know, I would look for something else similar. Uh, and that's how we got into UFOs, just by reading all the books in the library. Uh, and that was just at a small library in the suburbs of a, of a northern city. Uh, Newcastle in Northern England, and then going to the major city library and digging out the, each of the books in the, in the shelf of UFO books they had there as well. So by about maybe a year or so after I'd got interested in it, I'd read everything pretty much. I was quite a quick reader. I'd read everything that the, the city had uh, for, the, you know, for the public on UFOs. But of course, this was pre-internet days. I was a, you know, a fairly young, a, a young boy. There wasn't the kind of and I was quite naive as well back then, and I wasn't very sure of myself. So it was difficult to try and get you know, involved in groups uh, or write to uh, magazines to sign up for the newsletters that were around back then, say Flying Saucer Review, et cetera. Um, and you know, never mind what was happening on, on your side of the world, you know, all, all, all the newsletters across there, which I had no idea about, apart from being little footnotes sometimes in the back of some of these UFO books. Uh, but these were, you know, it was almost like a foreign language. Um, so there was a lot going on, but I was just privy to a really small part of it, just this this subset of books. 
books. Um, of course, as you get older, you, you start reading magazines, you see a lot more. And of course, when the internet started as well, just everything just exploded because you had this access to a hell of a lot of stuff. And I'm going back to the 90s here. So this was a dial-up connection uh, rather than having forums and, and blog posts and, and, and podcasts. You had uh, what they called um, bulletin boards and Usenet, yeah. that kind of stuff. And it was like, you know, you know these mailing lists. Yeah, you, old school, you, you, old school. Yeah. Yeah, old, old school, yeah. So it was like, you know, kind of chains of emails that people would. And I was, I was on the um, on the UFO groups as well, Twitter um, and on, on Facebook, you know, the conversations that people have. The kind of, you know, you'll have the bunkers on one side, the true believers on the other side. And people in the in the middle as well um that are, are doing stuff so um you know who are just trying to work out what's actually happening they've gotten they haven't got a dog in either fight kind of thing um and it was the same back then so you had patients you, had, you just didn't have the information we have now and of course that changed in december 2017 with the release of those three videos uh, that came out you know, with the help of lou elizondo chris mellon etc cetera, etc cetera. And that changed everything as far as I was concerned, because it, it brought some credible information to the public uh, and things that not necessarily couldn't be refuted, but certainly you couldn't ignore. And we have now we have then had people who were intimately involved in programs which could be documented. Uh, you know, there's obviously information come out since to say that, yes, Lou was part of you know the program, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and these people have never gone away. They're not just people who are coming out of the woodwork saying, oh, I did this, oh, I saw this, and then disappearing again. There are people who will stay with, with us you know, they're telling us things as much as they can without going to jail uh, and all the rest of it. Um, and they come up with some fairly credible information. All we need next now is just, you know, more evidence to back up what they're saying. And that's the stumbling block at the moment. But we've got everything else going on at the moment. So it's been a bit of a journey these last, you know, sort of 45, 50 years from things that I would never have expected in my lifetime to see. Uh, all the, the things that are happening now, all the videos which are coming out, you know, like them, love them, you sit in the middle, whatever, whatever, wherever you are on that spectrum. It's a hell of a lot more than we've had in the past. So, yeah, it's it's wonderful. It's it's bizarre. It's frightening. You name it. it, it but it's it's brilliant. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm pleased I'm still alive, you know, at this point in history. Um, I'm, I'm sure it can only get better, but, you know, I, I never thought I'd be here um, you know, for sort of 40, 50 years ago. Man, what a story. I'm so, it's so nice to see people in the UAP subject feel delighted at where they are now. There's kind of a lot of ire and, uh, I don't know. Uh, it's almost vindication there. as well, right? Yeah, I mean, certainly. Yeah. I, I mean, it's nice for us. We came after 2017, but people like yourself, Graham, have been, you know, you've been taking the punches and there were Mike Tyson punches, uh, let's face it, during those years. So for you to do what you did and stick to it, I mean, you're a pioneer in what is happening right now. So, yeah, take pride in that. Um, and I, I encourage anybody that's doing that, even the new dogs in the fight, like take pride in what you do. Uh, yeah, you're on definitely. the right side of history, right? You've got you've got to be positive because, you know. Years ago, with all the kind of knocks that you were getting, you, uh, the tinfoil helmet jibes and all the rest of it, and the fact that the media just didn't want to know in the subject, you know, you, and you got ridiculed from everybody that you spoke to or tried to speak to about the subject. So you got to the point where you just kept quiet, apart from the people who you knew were interested in it. But nowadays, it seems that everybody, if they know that you're interested in this subject, they want to ask you questions. Um, even you know, strangers or people that you meet or people that you've known, and you, you, the subject comes up, and, and they ask in your opinion. Uh, which people have never done before. So that, that's absolutely brilliant. Um, and it just shows how much it's permeating, the, you know, just much more widespread in, in, in the population at large, uh, which we've never had that before. People have been aware of the subject, you know, don't get me wrong, but they've never had as much interest, you know, even outside as, as they have now. And you can say that in the media as well. And people are just, you know, definitely, definitely wanting more information, but more credible information, uh, not the, you know, not the, the the sort of stuff we used to get, the, the alien autopsy videos and all this stuff that people are, seem to yeah, be making channel just to try. And, yeah, well, yeah, just yeah. the stuff that you, you can tell, which is either manufactured to try and get money or, or it's just there just to, as an audience pleaser. Um, you know, the, we need some proper credible information with, with stuff that can be backed up, corroborated, um, you know, and you go from there rather than just this kind of, you know, this airy fair very flim flam kind of stuff we've had in the past you know so sure yeah. so your your uh research started i mean you sort of had a a, a conjoint 
interest in like aviation in general, hmm. right? That's kind of yeah. also part of it and informed the angle that you took. So aviation, got- war, um, Second World War, German secret weapons and UFOs, and everything just came together with the Foo Fighters because it's all sure. linked. All that stuff is linked together. Yeah. So tell us the story. Tell us the the Foo Fighter story. Like I, all I know is that during uh, the war, there were reports of these luminous orbs that would sort of follow around mm. uh, fighter planes, and that both sides suspected it was the property of the other. And then after yeah. the war, we sort of realized that it didn't belong to any of us, and that was the end of it. But there's a lot of conflict. There's also a lot of um. I, I was listening to a podcast called High Strange. I just finished it up. It's eight parts. It's pretty good. But the guys are all new to the pot, new to the sort of UAP topic. And at one point, they conflate UAP. I mean, not UAP. They they conflate um, Foo Fighters and just sort of the the 1950s, 60s conception of a UFO, the the sort of like uh, saucer, silver saucer thing. But those mm. weren't exactly the same, right? You, like Foo Fighters had a definite like physical appearance, and and they they were unique in some way. Tell us about yeah. about that history. Okay. So basically what you've encapsulated there in terms of the description is pretty much what everybody, if you've been asked, say, in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, and even halfway through the 1990s to describe what the Foo Fighters were, that's what they probably would have said. And if you pinned them down to say, look, can you give me some cases? Chances are they would have come up with about half a dozen. And they were from the same unit, the 415th Night Fighter Squadron, which were based in eastern France, before um, around about uh, November, December 1944 uh, and into 1945. And yes, they were experiencing these red balls of light. And some of them were different colors, but they were mostly red. And sometimes they would see them in the distance, sometimes they would see them near the aircraft, and occasionally they would follow the airplanes as well at night uh, on the various missions they were, they were, they were on between uh, behind enemy lines. And this is kind of like over eastern France, eastern Belgium, west and Germany, you know, sort of west of the Rhine area. So that gives you a kind of area where the location is. Um, and when they did follow the airplanes, the pilots naturally would would put the aircraft into evasive maneuvers to try and shake off what they thought were German aircraft on their tail. But they found that they couldn't shake them, and that nothing they did seemed to shake them or just sit there until they flew off of their own volition. Um, sometimes it was more than one. Sometimes there were you know, numerous of the, the you know these things were seen. Um, but it turns out when you look in the in the records of some of the RAF bomber squadrons, um, say over the Balkans, so Romania, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, that kind of area, in earlier in 1944. So I'm going back to maybe sort of March April time. Um, they started seeing these things as well. So this is much earlier than the, when the Foo Fighter, as the name. Uh, when that was coined, which was at the end of November 44, uh, that actually just applies to what the American sightings uh, sightings were, because that's the name they give them. Um, But these things, whatever they were, similar things have been seen much earlier, so six months earlier in the Balkans. But actually, you can go back even to RAF intelligence reports going back to 1942, and you'll see mention of things that could well be interpreted as as the same, Um, what they call rockets, and then later they call them mm-hmm. jets in 44, because the terminology changes as what they think the enemy's technology changes. Uh, so you can see that you can see where the name, you know, the names alter, they go from one thing to another. Um, the Foo Fighter phenomenon itself, um, pi- uh, pilots and crews were exchanged between squadrons, and some of the ones who were based in northern Italy in 44 actually uh, were transferred to Europe uh, to northern Europe to help out. For a little while over about Christmas, January 44, uh, Christmas 44, January 45, when they went back to their units in Italy, they took stories of these things back with them and sometimes even sightings. And of course, then when you look in the records of these two Italian squadrons or uh, American squadrons actually um, operating in Italy, you'll see from February 45, the name Foo Fighter being used in their reports as well, because actually they were seeing them. Um, even before then, they were seeing them in 1944. RAF squadrons based in Italy were seeing them as early as night, uh, spring 1943. Um, so there's cases of, of aircraft being followed, um, you know, all the way through 1943. So, so how does this deviate from our from the um, the conception that we had? Like you're saying, the the standard story was that we started seeing them when and when do we? Yeah, November. Start well, them? the Americans, the 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 legend is that it was November 44 when it started, about the last week of November. 
But you're saying we've seen them since 42. Oh, yeah, the, yeah, the reports are much earlier. You just have to know where to look to find this information. But, of course, the, the legend has been built up. And I'll, I'll just give you a little quick sort of uh, rundown on this. Um, if you if you read books in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s about Foo Fighters, the very limited information came from one source. It came from an American Legion article, which was published in December 45 by um, a Lieutenant Colonel Chamberlain, who was uh, an aide to General Hap Arnold, who was the commander in chief of the US Army Air Forces at that time. And he was on a fa effectively a fact-finding tour uh, around European um, squadrons, um, you know, the night fighter squadrons and some other units as well in, in, who were in, in, in Europe fighting against the Germans. And I suppose nowadays you would call that being embedded with the troops. He was, you know, he was trying to find out how things were working, you know, whether logistics were working, what morale was like, all this kind of stuff. Um, but he was he was at least spent at least one night and maybe maybe a few days with this particular squadron, the four one fifth. Um, and of course, they started telling him, you know, all this stuff about what they'd seen and how they were being followed by these lights, et cetera, et cetera. And he wrote it all down. Now, we're not entirely sure what he did with that information at the time and you know, how far it went up the chain of command. But definitely afterwards, um, at the end of 45, this article was published in American Legion magazine, which is a forces newspaper, effectively. Um, and it has six instances of things that happened to the 415th. There's a couple of inf um, reports from the day uh, from daylight squadron, so uh, P-47 Thunderbolt or the Mustang squadrons who were operating over Germany at that time. And then there's a few um, references to a couple of cases which happened in the Pacific as well. So mm. that's about as much information as the public had at that time, because some of those cases had also appeared in the newspapers in America at the beginning in 1945 when they were reporting on the Foo Fighters. So they were nothing new either. Um, and that information was pretty much, with a few exceptions, all that ufologists had to go on for about the next 50 years. Uh, and you so that's more when you see it. What, what well, you... there, there was. Well, to be fair, there were, there was more out there. There was a few people that come forward in the in the in the subsequent decades to say, look, you know, I was flying a bomber or I was flying a fighter, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and we saw this, that, and the other. So you, you can't find these stories, but they did, they were never given the prominence that some of the other cases throughout those decades were given. Um, you know, it's almost like everybody just take the thought, oh, it's before 1947, it doesn't fit into the overall story that everything kicked off with Kenneth Arnold, so we'll just, you know, we'll just not talk about it kind of thing. And people obviously had their eye on other stuff that was happening, you know, much more recently, in, you know, because, well, why wouldn't you? Um, so by the end of the, by midway through the 1990s, some of the American archives opened up so you could get access to these squadron records. And there was a few people did actually dig in and they did get to find the original documents that showed those cases that Chamberlain had put in that article in, 40, in 1945. But then they found others as well. Um, so these were American reports. And then a couple of people in, in Britain, um, there was a guy called Andy Roberts and another guy called David Clark. They started doing the same in Britain. They they put letters out in, in various aviation magazines uh, in about the late 1990s, early 2000s, asking for air crew, former air crew, to come forward the stories. So there's a few more, you know, quite a few more stories came out then. But the thing that people hadn't done was look through the, some of the squadron records. Um, they hadn't gone through the, the mission reports. Now, I did that. And that's when I found the, the the cases from the Balkans and some others as well. And I'm still finding them now because I'm actually doing follow up to this book, um, which I'm still in the early stages of. And I'm finding even more cases which have never been, you know, ever been reported. Now they're not categoric proof that UFOs existed, but they just don't fit what was happening back in World War II. The descriptions of some of these things are, you know, quite frankly, the, the, you know, they just didn't exist then, but clearly they did because these things have been reported. And to make it even worse in terms of that narrative falling apart about everything starting in 47, some of these cases are from 1940. And that's even mm. before you guys got in the war, you know? So yeah. it starts very early. So uh, they're... And they're talking about, well, just one, one last thing. They're talking about aircraft with searchlights, and the Germans never used that kind of equipment. Um, so, you know, what would they say? And, and of course, the, a lot of the reports say they're not sure what they're looking at. They can just see lights. Um, and so, you know, and there is, but so from that, they're assuming that these are aircraft with searchlights or aircraft with headlights and all this kind of stuff following their bombers, sometimes for up to 250 miles. And it, none, of, none of this makes any sense whatsoever, but it's in the official intelligence reports. 
uh, and I'm finding month after month when I'm reading these things through the 1940, 1941, 1942, that they just don't know what they're looking at. So, you know, I was uh, thinking about this, you know, it's always related to war. Every time that oh, we're yeah. at war, there's a, a spell or a wave of these Foo Fighters. They follow aircrafts that carry certain ammunitions. I mean, it's fair to say the military doesn't, or the, the deep state doesn't want to tell anybody about this because they're fighting them, uh, it, because it's a threat to them. Like every time they go anywhere, these things are there. Uh, the Navy is not exempt from that. They're being followed underneath the water, mm -hmm. above the water. Uh, it's not just scanning the weaponry, but maybe even our intentions. Like we know these entities are, are known to be able to read minds, but if they find out what our intentions are with the weaponry in just a quick scan over, um, this is important. Uh, there's a connection between our warmongering amongst ourselves and their interest in it. And it seems like they monitor the big weapons that are going to cause more damage, um, mm. you know, like the nuclear. That They got really... Definitely. They got physical. Uh, I, I mean, they were, you know, Foo Fighters before the crash. Let's say at Roswell. After that, they became saucers. But when um, what's his face, Kenneth Arnold, mentioned, they were almost like skipping like saucers. Uh, they weren't shaped like saucers. They had a weird nope. shape, but they 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 said it was. Um, but after that, it seemed like physically they were manifesting in saucer shapes, whereas before we didn't have that. And now today we have weird phenomena. It's not so much saucer anymore. Do you have a theory as to why they keep changing to our appearance? I'm not sure they keep changing, Jason. I think there is a kind of, um, you'll see a majority of reports of a certain type or other, but the, the, there's such difference in the shape, sizes, colors, and um, the way these things you know, act and react that you can't really pin them down to one particular type and say, oh, look, you know, we're seeing this sort of thing here and that sort of thing then. Um, because when we were seeing saucer shaped kind of you know, objects, we were also seeing things that were called cigar shaped objects. Right. Now, cigar shaped torpedoes, tic tacs. Um, torpedoes, uh, aerial torpedoes were reported in World War II. Uh, they're in the intelligence files again of these things that are either class, well, they're called rockets sometimes, but they actually are described as being torpedoes, mm -hmm. sometimes with jets of flame coming out the back of them. Um, now, you would think that might be a missile, but where they're seen and when they're seen rules out any kind of German technology. So you, the things that we see, um, I mean, we're talking about this just before we brought, you know, you, you started the broadcast is that things come around you. Know, it's like kind of circular. Um, so things that you, we saw in the past start, you see them again, but they might be just called something slightly different. But that doesn't mean to say they haven't been seen in the past. And chances are we'll see them again in the future. So the things that were that Kenneth Arnold um, saw, which were described as actually heel shaped to start with. I know a lot of people have said, oh, they look like a flying wing, but that was much later. The, ch the story seemed to change into what they looked like. Uh, or what he described them to be, because the original letter that he sends to inf Air Force investigators um, um, to say, this is what I saw, just days after the event as well, he draws them at the end of the, uh, the letter, and it looks like a, the heel of a, of a shoe. Um, so, you know, this is really what... With a crescent. Yeah, with a, with a, yeah. Yeah, with a little mark, yeah. So, um, like a boomerang almost, rounded boomerang. Well, no, it's not actually. No, it's not. You, you can imagine, like, if you take the heel off your shoe and look at it from above. Okay. Uh, that's what it looks like. So it's got that indentation in it. Um, oh, okay. like that, okay. rather than being like a kind of crescent. Um, okay. Because mm -hmm. when you'll see in the popular pictures of Arnold sh holding up that artwork, it's like it's like a crescent. It's like a flying wing aircraft, like the, the Horton flying wing from World War II. But that's not what he originally said he saw. Um, so. Sometimes the names change in the telling. So, um, yeah, so you've got to be careful with, you know, how things are portrayed because sometimes what people say, oh, well, that's that because it because he saw that, that's what he must be seeing. Well, actually, no, if you go back to the original documentation, that's not what he said he saw. So like the telephone you have to, game, right? <laughs> you Remember have to that trace game? Things, yeah. Yes, yeah, or Chinese whispers. You yeah. have to trace everything back to its source to find out what the real, you know, sort of uh, information was. So and is there one actually, typology for like uh for foo fighters? Is, was there no, one there wasn't. consistent appearance? What are the kinds of things that are seen? Well, I, I know mean, them as light, yeah, so that's it. Yeah. So if the I mean if you're talking about generally everything that was seen in World War II, there's all sorts all shapes and sizes, but the foo fighters themselves, this subset of things that were seen in World War II were just lights. They weren't attached to airplanes. 
even though um, the intelligence um, experts higher up the chain of command, when this was reported to, they came back to the part to the to the intelligence officers in the squadron and said, "Well, which part of the aircraft are these lights attached to?" Because they had no, you know, no kind mm -hmm. of idea about what was going on, and they had no comprehension uh, even uh, about what was happening. So there was a failure to try to connect the dots. No, the pilot is seeing lights. That's all they're seeing. The lights were different colors. They acted in various different ways, sometimes following the aircraft, sometimes not. But other things were seen in World War II. So these things that looked like rockets that were zigzagging around the sky, they were seen as well, um, behaving un-rocket-like, un-flying bomb-like. Um, there were other things. That, um, there was a battle over um, near Leningrad in, 19, in February 1943, the, the Battle of Krasny Gore. And there's some um, Spanish volunteers fighting on the, on the side of the Germans, but they're in a Spanish infantry division. It's called the 250th uh, Infantry Division, or the Blue Division, it was called. And they are, they are there in, in, in this battle. And a group of these soldiers look up um, above the battlefield and above these Russian and German aircraft, which are also slugging it out uh, above them. And there's this thing looking like an upturned bathtub sitting up there watching everybody. So that's another story. So that's that's concerning. Story. Yeah, there's a, a, an RAF bomber crew flying over the northern over the Italian Alps on the way to bomb an engine factory in Turin in November 1942. And from this Lancaster bomber, the crew see this what they estimate to be two or three hundred foot long torpedo shaped object, and then they see it again uh, a little bit later in the mission, flying down a mountain valley in between the peaks of the mountains. So there's another shape entirely. Um, civilian, as a civilian on the ground in, I think it's Czechoslovakia in 1944, he reports seeing a kind of zeppelin shaped object. There was no zeppelins around then, certainly not in you know that part of Europe. Um, so there's like a similarity again. So you can see the you know, same sort of things being reported. Um, but yeah, there's, there's wing, wingless craft are, are mentioned in various reports. There's a, an, Amer an Army Air Force bomber uh, on an anti-submarine patrol over the Bay of Biscay. So that's off, um, off Spain, off France, that kind of bit of sea off those two countries, um, just south of Britain. Um, and it's on an anti-submarine patrol in November 42 again. And this, what they describe as a wingless craft, come up behind the aircraft. It sits with them for 10, 15 minutes, does a 180 degree turn and flies away again. Photographs were supposed to be taken of that object by one of the crewmen, but those have never surfaced. Um, so, so they, they don't know. just have unique forms; they, their behavior yeah. is also intelligent, troubling. all different. And, uh, yeah. yeah, but but there's like hovering behavior. It sounds like you're saying, yeah. and uh, fast moving, and... hovering, or you you name it. Almost, it, it's 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 imagine you, you imagine everything that you've seen you know in the years after World War Two. It's almost encapsulated in World War Two. And we're just we're, we're basically just scratching the surface of the, of the reports because there are still lots of well RAF squadron documents I still haven't gone through yet uh, because I'm only touching the surface of them and we don't I have no idea what other intelligence documents there might well be you know it's just a question of trying to find them and, and maybe stumbling across them um, and I'm sure there's there's a you know a heck of a, a lot of stuff that the American you know the Army Air Force had back then as well, which people still haven't managed to get access to for one reason or another. Not necessarily because it's secret, just because you haven't put the right search parameters in. Let's say, um, you sure. know, because a lot of things don't you know you can't just say uh, UFO reports World War Two because obviously that terminology wasn't used back then. So right. and they didn't think that's what they were anyway because that hadn't entered the lexicon. It hadn't entered popular thinking. So they're not classed as that, but you have to be creative. You have to look for intelligence reports that um, look at um, flak explosions, you know, anti-aircraft shell explosions, that kind of stuff. That's how you get into these kind of reports, because that's actually where they're reported. When they did analysis of how effective anti-aircraft guns were, you often see reports of strange flying things in those reports, especially from some of the army officers uh, who flew in the bombers over on raids over Germany because they they would do detailed reports of everything they saw in the mission and those you know are sometimes little gold mines of 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 details so yeah it's knowing where to look and of course if you're an, a UFO researcher um, who has a general knowledge of of maybe everything uh, but not a specialized knowledge of World War Two then you might not necessarily have the wherewithal to be able to like you know dig into these things that's not a criticism it's just a you know it's just stating a fact whereas somebody who has a bit more idea of how these things work might be able to find them a bit better um but of course you know that's just going from my experience as an aviation historian as well 
I'll leave it to these guys as well as some of the people who went before me because they're much better at other things in ufology than I'll ever be. So, you know, we all have our strengths and weaknesses. So, uh, Olivia Cat, by the way. What's that? Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I keep watching his cats go to and fro. I'm like, man, I hope they pick a fight. That'd be awesome to see. Oh, are they? In the background. I, I don't have no, no. my own screen on. I yeah, one there's them. two now. There's there. <laughs> there was only one before, but now there's two. So she must have snuck up here. Love it. They're very sneaky. So what? One question, uh, Graham, is that we've been firing and trying to take these things down from the oh, start. Yeah. And uh, David Grush, I mean, in Congress, they asked him, "Has there ever been consequences or damages to humans?" related to these things and he's like oh yeah right um my guess is is that there's a lot probably more military incidences with these crafts i mean now we are hearing from grush that we came up with some sort of emp on our jets to bring these things down they brought three of them down recently here in north america i think it was last year uh, of mm -hmm. course, no news on that. They didn't do a recover or anything. They're good. They're good. They just flew away, um, <laughs> which is full of shit. Uh, but, you know, they're shooting these things down. My concern is somebody who's not elected, it was never voted in. People are making decisions on our behalf to shoot at something we don't understand, mm -hmm. picking a fight with something that is clearly more advanced than we are. Uh what are your thoughts on that? Because it's not just the United States. I mean, every country is in it for themselves. China's shooting on them. Uh, Russia shooting on them. Uh, all the major powers are trying to get, you know, so what are your oh, thoughts yeah. on that? Like, what, what are the consequences of our technology well, increasing and then picking a fight with something that we shouldn't really be picking a fight with? Well, you go back to the conquistadores. You know, they, they come with advanced weaponry, don't they? And they're fighting people who have effectively spears and bows and arrows. And if yeah. you're going to fight a, a knight with armor uh, and all the rest of it with with a bow and arrow, mm -hmm. then you're probably going to come off worst. Uh, so yeah, there's that. Uh, I guess the air force or air forces around the world will have specific rules of engagement as to you know how they deal with things that they don't understand. Um, and I guess also it depends on what kind of a threat. That they're, they're, they're assessed to pose as to whether or not they are brought down. But I'm just going to go back to World War II for a second here, Jason, if you don't mind. And you're a master were, in it, of course. <laughs> <laughs> things were fired on back then. Um, now, obviously, we don't know whether you know aircraft were, were blown up because if the pilots were killed, the crews were killed, then we'll never hear from them. But we do know, of, or at least we, we are aware of certain incidents that happened when there doesn't appear to be any, any kind of comeback whatsoever. So March 1942, uh, a Polish crewed Wellington bomber through a one squadron Royal Air Force flying back from a mission on Essen in the Ruhr in Germany. And they're flying over Holland. And from behind the aircraft comes this amber disc. The tail gunner of the aircraft shouts over the intercom, the pilot, you know, we've got something coming behind us. The pilot said, well, obviously the, everybody thinks it's a night fighter, so a German night fighter going to shoot them down. So the pilot says, you know, open fire on it when it gets close enough. So, of course, it comes close in, into range, and the tail gunner opens fire with his rear gun turret, which has four uh, 0.303-inch machine guns. And these, every tenth round is a tracer round, so it's an illuminated round rather than a bullet, okay. and it shows you where the, the, the bullets are going at night. That's clever. These bullets yeah. go... Yeah, that's how they used to do things back then. Um, they were called tracer rounds. Uh, I think they're still, I'm sure they still use this kind of thing now. They would still use tracer rounds sometimes. Yeah, I'm sure they do. Well, yeah. actually, anyway. your background, there's there's some firing in a background. Yeah, well, this, the this, some this, red is the cover of the, this is the cover of the UF, of the Foo Fighters yeah. book that I wrote, and it actually depicts this incident. So these bullets are going into this disc, and nothing happens. It's not like the whatever object it is, whether it's an airplane or whatever, it doesn't fall away on fire, it doesn't explode. Um, it doesn't try to evade. It just almost absorbs these bullets. You know, they go in and don't come out the other end uh, and nothing happens to the object. It just sits there and takes it. After uh, how many rounds have been fired at this thing, the actual, the disc then flies round to the wingtip of the aeroplane and sits off the wingtip. All of a sudden, you know, all the time, the, the gun, the, the gun turret's tracking round um, and firing at this thing. Um, and it gets to the point where it's sitting far enough off the wingtip that actually the nose gun turret can also, he can turn his turret sufficiently far enough backwards that he can fire at this thing as well. So the the the, the person in the in the, um, in the gun turret, and both gun turrets, they're firing at this object to no avail whatsoever. 
But then, to add insult to injury, it flies around to the front of the aircraft and sits at a certain distance in front of the nose, and they're both flying through through you know, over Holland at, the, at about maybe two hundred miles an hour or so. Uh, and this thing's just you know keeping station you know at a certain distance in front of the aeroplane. And the nose gunner again, he's turned his turret back you know to point ahead, and he's firing this thing, and nothing's happening. And after a little while, it just shoots off at forty five degrees up into the heavens and disappears. They're jerks. <laughs> they get back. They get back to the gr- on the ground at the base, and the er, after every mission, there was always a debrief. Intelligence officer would come and ask them what was happening, um, and they tell the story. And the first thing he says was, "You know, have you been drinking?" <laughs> but there's a crew in the kind of group of aircraft behind them. They say they saw it too, so there is kind of cooperation of a sort, but it's not documented anywhere. It was. Um, it was told to a researcher this story in about 1962 or so. So it's quite an old story, but one that's never really been given any kind of problems whatsoever. Well, even the Battle of Los Angeles, weren't we firing at these things True. for six or eight hours like with 30, no avail? Hundred shells fired at that thing, um, and <laughs> like, nothing happened. Yeah, you can't dismiss that. That's that's pretty bad. Like anything, a flock of seagulls would have come down with the artillery shells we were sending up there. I well, mean, a balloon on an airplane would have. I mean, the, 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 the kind of um, the response, the the excuses that you get for that thing are where it was war nerves, or it was a Japanese airplane, or it was a balloon that, got, that escaped. Um, any of those things, well, yeah, okay, you know, a balloon or an air, or a Japanese aircraft, even an American aircraft, would have been filled so full of holes that it would have come down. But this thing not only flew past the, every, all the gun sites, it then turned around and went back up again. So, you know, to, uh, again, to add insult to injury, and they were still trying to shoot at it, and nothing nothing happened. For hours. Um, like, you oh, either yeah, for ages, your ages, job, ages. Yeah, or exactly. this is legit, right? Like, there's that's no right, in-between. Yeah. God, yeah. yeah, that's crazy. So and it was, tra- your, it was tracked your, on radar as well. So, do you have a theory about what these things are? I mean, are you a, a, an ETH extraterrestrial hypothesis, or do you? Uh, so I'm going to disappoint. Any... I'm going to disappoint you here because I don't really have any hard and fast opinions of what they are. I'd leave that to people, especially readers, to work it out for themselves because I don't want to actually put ideas in their head. I'd rather sure. them read what I what I the kind of information as I find it and put it to them and say, well, look, what do you think these things are? Do you think after all this information, there is something to this? Or are you not sure? Or do you still think there's, you know, it's just a, a, a lot of rubbish? Um, because really, I've, over the years and, and, and going back several decades, you know, I, I'd say these books, that are, some, of the, some of the books I'd read, not all of them, the, 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 the ones which weren't as good, they would try and shoehorn stuff into a book to make it fit a narrative. And anything okay. that you know was inconvenient, they would leave out, and then they would put other stuff in. Or the, you would get these kind of leaps of logic where you'd think, "Well, how do you get to there from where you've just started from?" And, it, and right. even at a young age, I would look at some of these things where they were saying, "You know, blah, blah, and I would just, "Well, how how do you get there from here?" And some of it just didn't make any sense whatsoever. And I vowed, if I ever got the position, I mean, this is going back a long time, but I thought back then, if I ever get the point where I can write a book, I would never do this. I would just put the information down as I found it and let the reader decide. I think it's much better that way because really, I know we've all got opinions. Mine's no better than anybody else's. Um, you know, people might call me an expert on the Foo Fighters, but actually it's just that I've found out more stuff than certain other people have. That doesn't make me an expert on something. Actually, I still don't understand. You know, it just makes me a little bit more knowledgeable than, than certain other people. But that's nowhere in any shape or form being an expert, I'm afraid. Um, so yeah. I don't know. I mean, I'm supposedly an expert on something because I have a PhD, but I don't feel any more like an expert than you're describing yourself. Mm. I mean, I know more about I put some time into something yeah. and and I'm probably smart, but I don't think it's out of the capacity of other people to do the same. I've just put that work in and it sounds like yeah. you've done the same thing. You've got a much more informed opinion and you certainly don't have you know, exhaustive knowledge of, of the thing. There's almost nothing that you can really have exhaustive knowledge about the world's just too complex, but I, I really appreciate the work that you've done. I think you are an expert. You just never feel like one. I think Michael, I think what I've had been able to do, however, is rule out certain things, because if you look, if you look, if you do an internet search for Foo Fighters, you'll see people who are trying to tell you 
until they're blue in the face that, you know, these were just German secret weapons um, or that the Germans were inventing flying saucers because there's a stranded opinion that thinks that's the case. But actually, when you go into these stories and you, and you do, you know, dive into them and you try and trace them back to where they started from, you will find that they don't amount to very much. And part of the Foo Fighters book, because I, yes, OK, I use the word Foo Fighters, but it wasn't about everything that happened in World War Two. And the, the last kind of third of the book basically tries to explode the myth that the Germans invented flying saucers or they had some weird and wonderful apparatus that could have been mistaken for Foo Fighters because that's another strand of, um, you know, uh, gobbledygook that's out there. Uh, there's a uh, there's a lot of um, people actually point to a, um, a book that was written by an Italian guy in, in the late 60s who tried to uh, basically tell everybody that there was those two particular types of German secret weapon that could have accounted for all these things. And mm -hmm. again, you go into all of it and it just, it's all pure nonsense, but it's a long lasting nonsense and it's, it's persisted and it's built upon. And then people basically just perceive it as fact because they see it written down places or they see it sure. on the internet. So therefore it must be true. Uh, and you see it regurgitated in all manner of places. You'll see it on documentaries. You'll see it in books. You'll see it on mm. TV, you know, uh, everywhere. Um, it, it's, you know, and you end up playing, you know, whack-a-mole with this kind of thing, because as soon as yeah. you've, you've sort of, you know, argued one, and there's another one pops out. And, and you see it on Facebook as well, that every so often somebody pops up and goes, hey, guys, has anybody seen this? You know, that's really interesting. You have the, no, we'll see. Yeah, it's all, been around uh, for, you know. So, yeah. so there's, it has a sort of initial plausibility, though, because, during the war, we are in a sort of race of, you know, technological sophistication, trying to, to pursue jet propulsion and other things oh, yeah. and, and, and get those things right. So there are these anxieties and Germany probably was in in certain very important respects, more technologically sophisticated than at least the the American uh, army was at the at least at the beginning of the war. But. Uh, so, so the anxiety about that sort of gives a, an initial ground to the speculation that well, they they did have se secret weapons, and so maybe that must be it. Can you give us a quick rundown of why it's all just nonsense? I mean, people probably read about things like Die Glocke or the Bell, uh, which is is some code name for a, a, a secret German uh, something or other that we that the Americans evidently uh, yeah. got hold of. Uh, if you read, uh, I think Hunt for Zero Point. He, uh, Nick Pope tells this this story, uh, but there's there's all this mystery around those those things. Uh, how how yeah. do you sort the gobbledygook from the the truth? Well, they're fairly, they're fairly seductive kind of like stories, uh, and I first came across the um, the. The stuff about the de Glocker in Nick Cook's book Hint for Zero Point, as you mentioned, and it was also a documentary which was on, on the TV uh, in here in Britain in, the, in probably the late nineties, early two thousands. I can't remember exactly when now. Um, but in terms of German flying saucers, I remember reading about those in about nineteen eighty two. Uh, so that's going back a fair while. In a book about German secret weapons, just uh, about the air airplanes that they were building, uh, and seeing this stuff and thinking, okay, well that's new. I've never heard about that before. And then finding nothing else about it. Um, but it turns out that that particular side of things, that the flying discs myth, uh, it all originated from a whole load of people who came out of the woodwork in the early 1950s saying, I was a designer, I built these things, I tested these things, all this kind of stuff. Um, and there was newspaper reports in various German and Italian uh, newspapers and magazines at about this time, so 50, 51, 52, etc., um, saying all these kind of stuff, but none of them could be backed up. There's never been a shred of evidence to suggest that any of these people were in the positions they were. One even said he was a test pilot for Henkel, a German aircraft manufacturer, but there's no evidence to suggest that he ever was. Um, there's another guy who said he worked on uh, the V2 rocket program, but then some of the other stuff he comes out with is so outlandish that it can't be possibly true. He talks about flying um, out of Breslau, which was a, a, Rus a city surrounded by the Russians in 1945 where he was supposed to be working on one of these flying saucers, and then he's flown out of the city in a, a measurement comet, the, the jet, the, the rocket-propelled interceptor that the Germans flew. Well, it was a single-seater. Uh, they did have a twin seat, but it didn't have an engine in it. It was a glider. So, you know, there's all this kind of stuff that um, it couldn't have possibly flown this aeroplane out of there. It's just preposterous. Um, and also, this, air, this particular type of aircraft was only operated in one part of Germany with specialised fuels, a specialised support structure, and all the rest of it. There's no way they could have had these other aircraft somewhere else to fly them. So none of this story makes sense. And then you dive into the other aspects of the Dismith, and you can see similar 
inconsistencies and outright lies. And then there's also a CIA document from 1954, which is just a translation of a foreign language newspaper, which says, I think it's from a South African newspaper, funny enough, in Afrikaans, hmm. that says, uh, that mentions about a German guy called George Klein, who says he was uh, part of the secret weapons um test kind of over uh, overarching um the, the people who looked after secret weapons programs he was kind of a he was a, an administrator rather than an engineer um and that he was privy to a, a test flight of one of these discs in in february 45 um now that's the only, so people say oh well it must be real because it's a cia document well no it's a translation of a foreign newspaper that doesn't make sure it's real you know it's just reporting on something that somebody else reported but this is how people latch on to these things and then you know it's it sort of the story evolves and it's your chinese whispers you know it, it changes in the telling and then it becomes fact down the line and it's very very hard to dismiss but Nevertheless, when you trace things things back to the source, you'll find there isn't much truth in them at the at the end of the day. And then, of course, those people the claim sixth... that the oh, sorry, sorry to cut you off. Go ahead. No, nope. yeah, no, go on. It, it's just that they claim that they were designing or building or both these flying discs. These what did they claim gravity pro propelled these things? How did the? I mean, like, well, this is where it all gets a bit vague. This okay. is all. This is where it gets very vague about how, what the power system is. Um, there's, there's sometimes you get cutaway drawings, but none of it makes any sense, and nobody has been able to replicate this kind of stuff. Because, quite frankly, if there'd been engineers in the fifties who were building this kind of stuff, we'd be flying around in them now. You know, we wouldn't need fossil fuels. We wouldn't be having a climate crisis. We we would be zipping around in in one of these things that were built then. And if so, why haven't they won the war if they had these? Uh, these wonderful, sure. you know, Vundava, uh, I, Vundava, I, you know, so, I, yeah, I have a theory, Vundava, gentlemen. That's funny. Yeah, I, I got a theory, gentlemen, and I just need to set it up. And, and, and I might be out there, but I just need your input. Go for uh, it. We're part of the primate family. And one of the, I wouldn't say qualities, but one of the biggest factors in primates is the violence. Um, not only that we cause to each other amongst primates, uh, you know, chimpanzees, do the same thing as us. They'll invade other territories and kill the other chimpanzees to gain access to that territory. Even cab cab uh, cannibalism, I'm having a hard time with my words, uh, is practiced amongst chimpanzees uh, when they take over another territory as a form of, of frightening the other chimpanzees. I always thought about this in the sense of what if from the get-go we are an experiment, but we're more of a biological weapon because of our aggression but technology in our hands is very threatening to another civilization that's more peaceful. The advancement that we get is maybe just trying to progress us to a faster level to be, you know, uh, why is it that they're so fascinated with our, our weaponry, our wars? Is it that they're keeping updates on our progress or are they interested in how we destroy each other? There's an interest there and we have to start thinking about what is that interest is it for them? Are they worried? I don't think they're worried about themselves. I think they'll be just fine. But there's a reason why they're interested in us. It's either because they're worried or because we're of purpose to them. And uh, this is what I constantly think about in our wars because they're always close to weapons that are going to cause death and people who are intent on causing death. That's their mission. They come up close and they check it out. And, and so that's, maybe that's what's interesting about us is, is yes. our violent sort of in, ingenuity or something. Absolutely. And we fire on them. Nothing happens. <laughs> they're like, oh, they're cute. They're not <laughs> quite there yet, but that's cute. It's like a toddler having a tantrum, right? Um, but that it's a theory we have to look at. It's it's a different perspective of saying that they're a threat to us. Maybe we're a threat to others and we're service to them. Like we have to start thinking outside the boundaries of conventional homo sapien thinking and i just want to throw it out there to see if that had any validity amongst men like yourselves i think um wars tend to bring out the best and the worst of people um so you get you know huge courageous people you get acts of valor you'll get the worst you know depravities uh, and everything in between but yeah. it's also it's a time of extremes um, you know, everybody, the whole range of emotions are shown. It's not a normal situation for people to be innovation in as well, though, Graham. Yeah. Well, well exactly. That's, yeah. I was coming to that. Yeah. So people are, you know, are very, very kind of motivated to improve themselves, uh, to improve what they do, you know, how they do things, just uh, just general things, never mind weapons. 
Um, but other, I mean, there's another argument as well. It, it, there's a strand that thinks that you know the, whatever these things are, they might just be time travelers from the future. You know, they might be us from the future looking back. Um, and my kind of view on that would be, if that is true, and, I'm, and that's a big if, um, because we people like myself have a, a kind of a, this morbid fascination with with like World War Two, uh, for instance. You know, if there was one period of history where if I had a time machine, I could go and have a look without any kind of penalty or fear or of being changing the future or whatever, this kind of stuff. And I could look at, it would be World War II. And I'd probably look at the Eastern Front in World War II because it's something I've always been interested in as well. So, you know, if I could sit in a bubble and watch a battlefield from, you know, from 10,000 feet or whatever, like a kind of God's eye view of what was going on, sure, I, I would take that opportunity. So I can imagine if there was something like an upturned bathtub again, you know, above the Battle of Krasny Bor, um, and here's some future historian, some future version of me with a you know, with a high tech notebook and pen, going, "Oh yeah, I can see what's going on here." You know, that would be a fantastic opportunity. You know, people would take that. They would go on uh, on cruises. You know, so they could go and watch. Um, you know, they could watch the Battle of Britain. Oh, they could God. watch um, the Battle of Midway or, or Pearl Napoleon. Harbor or something yeah. in real time. Yeah, Napoleon, exactly. You know, anything like that, or the Korean War, or what we would do. Or, you know, you, you and I would do in Iraq, in Iraq, kind of thing. Our country, sorry, our countries were doing in Iraq. You know, all this kind of stuff. You, you can imagine the opportunities that people in the future might take to do it. Now, I'm not saying that's correct, and that's what I think, but it's one possibility. But equally. An outside agency of some description sees, you know, the monkeys are fight are throwing rocks at each other again. You know, uh, maybe they don't do that. Maybe they settle differences amicably. You know, uh, a different way. And maybe we are the only species um, species in the in the world in the universe who settle our differences by throwing rocks at each other. Yeah. You know, so maybe that's why we're so special. It's worked so well of, so far, right? Well, it's yeah. worked. Like, maybe that's why they watch us very yeah. closely because that's how we settle differences. You know, we do that. So mm -hmm. who knows? Yeah, I think Michael. that, um, yeah, well, my, my thought is that I have several thoughts. One is that I'm part of me is skeptical about whether UAP activity actually increases during war times or if we are just engaging in the activity that allows us to encounter it more often, right? I mean, we have way more planes in the sky yeah. during wartime way more you know visual ob observers going on um we're also doing much more disturbing i'm like geologically disturbing things or dropping bombs and stuff so um you, if you had a if you had a bunch of sensors autonomous like flying sensors anywhere on earth and you just started randomly carpeting it with bombs you'd see uh, you know a rise in activity because they have to evade or whatever um so I, I don't know. We don't have any good experimental evidence of saying, well, let's just put a bunch of people in planes the way we would if we were in war and see if we get the same number of, of encounters or whatever. Um, so I'm kind and of not, they're not just that. they're not just trained observers either. They're actually they're highly motivated to watch out for things which are out of the ordinary. In in, mm -hmm. World War, in World War Two, you had you know tens of thousands of trained airmen. So whether they were gunners, navigators, pilots, you name it. So you had you know all the all the night bomber crews that were flying from Britain over Germany. You had the the daylight the American daylight raids uh, in, you know that were flying from from Britain as well. Then you have all the crews in the Pacific War, the ones in the Mediterranean, the flying North Africa, all these places. You know that. And they're, they're looking out for anything that might be a threat, you know, whether it's a, sure. an anti-aircraft gun explosion, whether it's a, um, a potential, you know, well, there were, um, you know, aircraft coming up to um, to, to attack them uh, or anything else that might be out in the ordinary. And they report it. It's not just to keep it to themselves. And think, oh, I'm not going to tell anybody. It's reported when they get back to base. It's all catalogued. It's filed. If it's, if it's interesting enough, it goes further and it becomes a subject of, intelligence reports further up the chain of command and they and they analyze it to death basically to make sure it's not the beginning of some potential threat uh because which is totally different from how it's done today i mean like today you have all these incentives to not report something if you see it because mm. you know there might be shame Stigma. or you might you be yeah. taken off flight status or something but there was like public propaganda from the from the, our government saying if you see anything strange tell the government because mm -hmm. we need everybody to be on the lookout this actually becomes carl jung's uh sort of uh <laughs> disingenuous explanation for the increase in in like civilian ufo 
observations after the war is that people are so uh, traumatized by looking up and tr wondering if there's going to be a bomber above them that they start, you know, just kind of seeing things out of the corner of their eye. Um, we, we later find out in 2009, after Carl Jung's Red Book was published, that he did not, he wasn't a naturalist who believed that there were no strange things in this guy. I mean, he was, he was uh, secretly a, a sorcerer who believed in magic and all sorts of stuff. But, um, but, but yeah, so I don't, I don't know if, if there's an increased interest in war, but uh, it would make sense if there were. Um, mm. But I also don't know, uh, there's, there's some part of me that wonders if our modes of behavior or our modes of observation influence the form that these phenomena take. I mean, I'm, I'm totally fascinated by the fact that during wartime, it's easy to perceive these things as aircraft. And during, um, you know, Kenneth Arnold doesn't say that he sees aircraft. He eventually says that he thinks they were organic uh, beings themselves. Uh, but it gets sort of miss. It gets bungled in by a by a journalist and says that he saw a saucer, and then we see a an explosion of of genuine saucer um, observations. Uh, and I and I wonder if there's some sort of reciprocity or, or or like circular cybernetic kind of influence going on there between the way we observe and what we expect to see and what actually manifests. But that's a totally speculative uh, realm at that point. It's strange, isn't it? Because people will see things again and again, and there's vast swathes of the human race apparently see, don't see them at all. Um, and then other people will see the same shape or uh, the same form, um, and then people see different ones as well. So is it a case of, you know, it, it can manifest itself as different shapes, different times? Or is it the same thing and just reveals itself in a different way but then of course there are stories of of sh of things that change shape during the observation as well sure uh, yeah. there's a noted one from 1954 of a labrador of a, of a, of a boa crew of an airliner crew seeing a shape which was then i think written off as mars if i remember rightly or something mm -hmm. like that anyway um but it was a and it wasn't just one shape there was one big shape and a whole load of little ones on either side of it. But the main shape effectively changed the way it looked over the period of a, you know, sort of several minute observation. Uh, and, the, and the pilots actually had the presence of mind to draw it, uh, to draw mm. the different types of shapes uh, involved. So they have some record of, you know, what it looked like. And it does radically change shape, um, which I don't believe a planet can do, at least not one I've seen anyway. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so there are stories seagulls. of things that do. It was do, seagulls. Yeah. It was seagulls. Oh, right. Okay. Well, look at yeah. There's seagulls. a great case that this reminds me of, of, um, it's i don't know if it's mufon or, or the french version of mufon is called like ovni but i know that there was a, a a family i think they're in france because jacques valet gives this photograph to gary nolan at some point where there's this family in france and they're driving along on a road trip and they've got one of these cars that has like a complete glass roof mm -hmm. on it you know you can see it yeah. through yeah um and i think there's like two teenagers in the back and like a, a mother and father in the front and they notice that there's something above them that's following them. Uh, and they, they all describe it similarly as, I think, disc-shaped disc and, and pretty large. Mm -hmm. uh, and the kids start taking out their phone and snapping pictures of it. And then when they look at the pictures later, it looks completely different from what all of them uniformly described it as being. It was a disc, I think. And then the picture shows it as being something much smaller and larger and, and, uh, and, and higher up. Uh, but having like seven spokes from a central small uh, circle or something. So I, I think there are, somebody could write a really good book on case studies where the, uh, where, where descriptions vary in some radical way, but there's good evidence that all of the descriptions are, are you know, at, at least corroborated, if not genuine. Yeah, it's also strange how um, people expect to take really good pictures of a, of, a, of a UFO with a mobile phone because they're not suited for that kind of thing. You try and take a picture of a high flying aeroplane with a mobile phone, you're going to get nothing, you know, yeah. of any substance uh, unless you've got a really good camera. Uh, they're well. starting to. Um, they're starting to. You can almost starting zoom on. to. Yeah, that's yeah. true. But then, but the ones say of the last ten years, you know, when you had a mobile phone camera, they're not going to do it. I mean, I've got an i14, but I still can't take a decent picture of a, of a, a 747 going over at 30,000 feet. No, you need a telephoto so, lens to do that. I mean, yeah, you do. Have... Yeah, that's right. Yeah. 
So but, you, whatever you have in your pocket at the time, you're not necessarily going to get a decent photograph. However, the pictures that you used to see back in the day, the ones that used to be in, this, in the UFO books back in the 70s and 80s, you'd be lucky if it was like a fuzzy black blob on a, on a, on a photograph. Yeah. And you just wonder about, you know, because photographs, uh, cameras were you know reasonably decent back then in terms of taking pictures. So what was it that actually just made them this fuzzy blob? Was it that you know the exposure was wrong, the um, the aperture was wrong, or was it that the whatever these things that we're trying to p- take pictures of, you know, rendered you know cameras um, you know make them you know impossible to take pictures of them properly? You know, did it actually just make them come out as blurs? Uh, it, it's really weird how there weren't any real definite shapes. And then when you did get a definite shape turned out to be a hoax you know adamski's mm. pictures you know because it, i think it's been proven pretty much that you know it's a it was like a kind of light housing that you could buy like a lampshade uh, with a few baubles or, or light bulbs stuck underneath it um yeah. funny enough uh, just as a quick aside once those pictures came out you then got the german hornaboo supposed flying disc pictures coming out uh, or the drawings coming out and they be uh, they bear a very very striking resemblance to adamski's pictures I was never an Adamski fan. I, I know a Adamski lot of people. Billy Meyer, one or two, anyway. It's, it's the yeah. one of these kind of like Joe, these these saucer pictures that look too good to be true. Um, so I'm pretty, I'm pretty sure it's Adamski's actually. Uh, but it, this is you, you, so you see these things and you think mm, it, the sharper the you know the, the thing people think well the sharper the better for these pictures, but actually it turns out that sometimes you know yeah okay they're just they're just hoaxes basically. Um, and a lot of the stuff that you would see from back then that were really sharp, with a few exceptions, of course. We're talking about the um, the McMinnville uh, uh, pictures of yeah. 1950. Yeah, the, the Paul Trent picture. That is clearly something anomalous because it's just never, ever been worked out what the heck that was. And he just shot that from a camera that, he, that his wife got out of the house for him. Uh, it was just outside uh, above the farm, wasn't it? Um, but it doesn't really give you much detail uh, beyond this kind of little plain black, but, very low hat shape. Yeah, um, I, I would say know, the most important the most impressive one, Graham, of I think it was nineteen fifty two, the flyover Washington, those uh, the yeah. the crafts or whatever. Usually, when you take a picture, it's like it seems large, and then you like you ever take a picture of the moon because it's so bright, and you try to show somebody, it's like a tiny little dot. It's yeah. like it doesn't yeah, do it justice. But you think about the nineteen fifties, and somebody captures these crafts, and they look large. So you got to think they must have been really massive in person. Mm. Compared to what's so it you know people said why don't they land on the White House lawn no they did a flyby <laughs> you know it's quite noticeable quite a few flybys those multiple nights. times yeah yeah multiple times yeah, so, two weekends in July nineteen fifty two it happened so, but see uh, it's this Force missing no- that it's this missing that that bugs me I say well nothing new's happened since okay but it only needs to happen once that's yeah. it it doesn't need to happen again the Phoenix lights. Uh, is like almost like a harbinger of other events that are going to take place. Mm. Uh, you know, it's at um, 1997, you got the, uh, the Phoenix lights, uh, you know, 2017, we get the article comes out. You got um, John Ramirez says that 2027 is a big reveal. So, I mean, it's coming. It's, it's, it, there's momentum. It's coming, but I don't, I don't necessarily put too much stock in people given predictions for dates. True enough. Because, true you enough. know, we've been we've been down that road with a lot of people. You know, the end of the world is nigh, and all you know, all these yeah. kind of cults who drink Kool Aid with new Nike. Yeah, all this kind of thing yeah. is going to happen, and it just and then they have to revise the date when the date arrives, and it turns out they're, <laughs> they're completely wrong. Yeah, so that's true. Um, yeah, I, I I tend to think, oh, just don't say that kind of thing. You know, it just it just it, it destroys people's credibility. I, I believe when it when they they try to come out with with stuff like that. But you know, they only have to be wrong uh, right once, as you say, don't they? Yeah. So, you know. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's the same thing as yeah, I was talking with. Yeah, I was talking with Michael. I'm like, you know, every day somebody makes a decision in the military or somewhere. Like, you know, when he came out with the nuclear bomb, they're like, oh, well, we don't know if it lights the atmosphere on fire. Mm. Fuck it. Let's let's light it up. Let's see what yeah, happens. Exactly. But they still did it anyway. Yeah, CERN. <laughs> they're like, oh, it might create a black hole when we activate it. Yeah. Fuck it. Activate it. Like every day somebody makes decisions that could ruin the planet. Oh yeah. Uh, so far track record seems okay, but you only need to be wrong once, once. right? Yeah. It's the same thing with ufology, I think. Um, and it's interesting. Like we have to study the past and, and, and to understand the future. Um, you know, history repeats itself and we, you know, we don't have much has, uh, recorded history, but we caught on pretty quick that something is happening. We're starting to write it hmm. down. So maybe my 
great, great grandchildren might be able to make sense of what we established now. China always thinks 150 years ahead. So they plan everything for 150 years ahead, everything strategically planned. We need to start doing that with this subject as well. We're probably not going to see the fruits of our labor, but maybe several generations later will, and they'll appreciate what we did at this point. And like I said, it's such a a huge honor to have you on today. Um, We'll have you on again because there's so much more to talk about. Uh, Michael, do you have any final questions for our guest today? Well, my my consistent question is, what books do you recommend that people read who are interested in in understanding the phenomenon in the way that that you do? What are the ones that have like really solidified your particular approach or, or, or body of okay. knowledge? So yeah, I'll scribble down three titles when uh, once we've been having a conversation uh, tonight. So in no particular order, well, actually they are in order, I guess, but, um, John Keel's Operation Tro- Trojan Horse. So it's not a nuts and bolts book. So if you're wanting case after case after case, it's not that type of book. But John Keel is, it was an author um, who try to stretch people's kind of understanding and you would throw things out there uh, and it was just you do actually read the book and you come away thinking that's a really really good point what Mm. would that end you know what what does that kind of mean and that just makes that book actually all of John Keel's books but that one in particular um, I mean, I know you wrote about Mothman, and, and, and that's actually quite a good book as well. But Operation Trojan Horse sure, yeah. definitely get, get that should be a, a, an addition. You know, that should be on every ufologist library. Uh, the other one would be uh, the second one would be Above Top Secret by Timothy Good. Hmm. It's possibly the book that got a lot of people in Britain interested in this topic back in the 1990s. And funny enough, I actually remember him being on a late night BBC radio show, or one of the main oh, uh, radio it. networks in in Britain, talking to the to the to the to the presenter, and the presenter being effectively blown away by some of the stuff that Tim Good was coming out with. Mm. Um, you know, he was talking actually, he was talking about Majestic Twelve. Now, I don't necessarily have a, a great deal of faith in the actual validity of those documents. However, the way he was, you know coming across well not just that but everything else about what he was talking about in ufology it was really really interesting and he did actually put a lot of people on you know um towards this topic and the book itself is great uh if you ignore the mj12 stuff which isn't it's pretty minimal but go into you know he, he does go into a lot of depth about a lot of cases sizable so, as well isn't it like it's, <laughs> that's it's, the one yeah, yeah i could kill a man with this i've got a different cover in mind because they, they comes out in different in different covers but uh, i've got the original paperback version um, and it's it's brilliant, yeah. It was a book I've read several times uh, over the decade, over these last three decades or so. So yeah, it's well worth reading. And the last one, and I don't know if you've heard this one before. This is called Invisible Residence by Ivan Sanderson, and mm-hmm. it's about USOs. Oh, excellent! Yeah, need to hear more about that submerged yeah. object. <laughs> yeah, so that's one you should really have a look at if you're interested in that kind of thing, or if not, and you want something different to read. Fantastic. And what are the books that you, you what, what is the most recent book that you've put out? And you also have a new book coming so, out. So yeah, I've just, those. Com- I've just completed a book on, I mean, most of my, well, all of my books deal with aerial uh, encounters. So whether it's pilots or air crew, um, uh, apart from the Food Fighters book, which is a general look at World War II. So the one I've just completed, which it hasn't, it hasn't officially got a title yet. I'm still waiting for the artwork and the forward to be finished is about the 1955-1956 aerial encounters with UFOs. Um, But I have just, uh, last year I finished the 53 to 54 book. uh, That was called Intercept and Identify. And then Mm. you go back a bit and that had a, um, that that, that was, yeah, it's it's, it's quite a a decent volume uh, that looks at the cases over those two years. Uh, there is a volume between for uh, looking at the same kind of cases between 1950 and 1952. It's called Flying Saucer Fever. The, f- the forward for that was written by one Louis Elizondo. Oh nice. yeah, we've heard that name. Oh, yeah. I think. That's, yeah, uh, you might have heard that unknown, name unknown, yeah. but he's making waves. Yeah, yeah, he's a, yeah, <laughs> yeah. He's a he's a he's a good mate. Is Lou? Uh, so yes, he he wrote that for me, which I'm eternally grateful to him for. Um, and then before that, there's a, a similar book looking at 1946, so again, before Kenneth Arnold, through to 1949, and that's Dawn of the Flying Saucers. And uh, one George Knapp wrote the forward to that as well. So I've been pretty lucky with the people who've been writing forwards. Um, and the, the, the person writing the forward for your new book is uh, secret uh, still. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to say who that is yet, because 
uh, this person, and I was saying, you know, uh, who they are, but they haven't finished writing the forward yet. I hope to get it by the end of the month. Uh, but sure. people, will I'm, know almost who, I'm almost done. I'm almost done. People, who, almost people done. Who will know who they are. Um, <laughs> and then in terms of the Foo Fighters book, well, that was um, um, UFOs before Roswell, so it's a European Foo Fighters, nineteen forty nine forty five, which gives you some idea of what it was about. But Sean Cahill, who was one of the the witnesses to the two thousand and four Nimitz encounters. Uh, he has a personal connection to the Foo Fighters because his his dad was a, a B seventeen waste gunner during World War Two, oh, wow. um, and he he'd come across things like this. So uh, he was, um, you know, he, Sean said, "Yeah, I'll definitely write the forward for that book." Uh, when he found out I was doing it, so uh, he was only too happy to do that. So, we'll yeah. put all those so, books in the description of the video for uh, for our audience, and uh, uh, we we highly recommend Graham's Graham's writing. He's an excellent researcher and a really enthusiastic guy we're glad to have you on the show man we'll we'll have you back thank you what's nice is the passion when somebody's passionate about something you'll pay attention like if somebody's passionate about thumbnails even though you don't care about thumbnails the passion that they have you're like oh you'll listen you'll learn something yeah. Yeah. ufology that's what we need we need passionate people i think you know we have too many people are sort of like on the like the, the somber aspect of the phenomenon and i get that there are some you know some pretty dark places to go but i think being enthusiastic and saying hey we're learning something that is part of the universe that you know we weren't aware of before that's 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 our new exploration that's like you know mm -hmm. discovering new continents it's important and we should be excited about it so it's great to have I think the, pe the people are just coming into the uh, into the subject from say 2017 they've got very probably little awareness of actually what happened in the decades beforehand. Right, so it's sure. important that we actually, you know, they're brought up to speed on that because there's a whole rich history that they're just not aware of. And the tip you know, of the they might have their, yeah. Well, exactly. But they also might have their kind of own voyage of discovery. They might latch onto something that maybe nobody else has picked up on before. So it's important that, you know, people get to grips with the, the stuff that's happened beforehand uh, to, to obviously to, 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 to repeat a well um, um, phrase from the past, you know, those who forget their history are condemned to repeat it. So, yeah. you know, you have to know about what's happened before so you can go forward. So, yeah, it, it's really important that people, you know, look at this kind of stuff. And I'm not the only one. There are lots of people out there who are, are really interested in the history of ufology, and it's just getting that to a wider audience. So, you know, you're part of that. So thanks very much, both of you. Uh, thanks very Absolutely. much for the invitation. Yeah. I've really enjoyed this. Oh, Great absolutely. Let's have you back on again, my man. Thank you so much, Graham.